Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the first of the Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre public seminar um, series. Um, uh, my name's Rob Copeland. I'm director of the Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre here at Sheffield Hallam University. And this week marks the first anniversary of the opening of our fantastic facility, which is in Sheffield on the Olympic Legacy Park. And um, we are celebrating um, a number of activities and reflections this week that relate to our work to transform lives through innovations that help people move. Um, before I introduce today's speakers, just a quick bit of housekeeping. Um, I'm sure you're all very familiar with this by now, but um, uh, everyone will be muted um, as a matter of fact. And uh, if you do need to speak, we've got a question and answer session later on, then uh, you can unmute for that purpose. We would also ask people to turn their cameras off just so that we uh, we don't have the, the cat jumping on the sofa or a, uh, a delivery man coming at the door and all those sorts of things. So uh, please turn your cameras off um, whilst you are um, during the public lecture. Uh, we have a uh, comments box at the uh, bottom of the uh, the menu on Zoom. We would love you to um, add in that uh, in that chat box your your comments and your questions as we go along. We do have some time at the end for Q and A, and uh, we'll be picking out some of those uh, questions during that Q and A. The session is also being recorded and will be available on the AWRC YouTube channel, and we will share that uh, in due course once it's live. And then the final bit of housekeeping, the public seminar series will uh, run every couple of months. So please keep an eye on the AWRC website for uh, updates uh, on that and content for future sessions. So back to today, and uh, we are delighted to welcome Park Run to lead our first public seminar series. I'm sure they need no introduction, but Parkrun organise free weekly timed five kilometre events in parks across the world. Uh, Parkrun are one of our strategic collaborators here at the AWRC and we provide the home to the Parkrun research board that's chaired by Professor Steve Hake and you'll hear more on that later. But without further ado, I'm going to introduce today's uh, first two speakers. Uh, Chrissy Wellington, Head of Global Health and Wellbeing at Parkrun, and Mike Graney, Head of Analysis at Parkrun. Chrissy, Mike, welcome to the AWRC. Thank you so much for supporting our public lecture series. Um, over to you. Thank you, and thanks to AWRC for convening this important event, and for everyone that's joined us, taken time out of their really busy days to listen to us talk about our favourite topic, health, happiness, and of course, part one. Um, yesterday, I was actually a witness to a House of Lords inquiry, and it felt a bit like I was being fed to the lions in some kind of Romanesque spectacle. So I'm really relieved to be part of this really friendly webinar that will be a little less gruelling, hopefully. So I'd like to start off by saying thank you and a very happy birthday to the AWRC, although I'd actually like to hijack the birthday bash and use the occasion to also celebrate the achievements of the Park Run Research Board that Rob referred to. And I remember when the board was first founded back in 2014, Steve, I think you actually had hair back then, and there's been a few iterations of the board, but I think the real step change took place when the AWRC and Steve took over in ch as chair. And in the few years that we've been in partnership, we've achieved some really, really great things. And hopefully this webinar is also an opportunity not only to celebrate the first birthday, to, to reflect back on the work of the board and share some of uh, the outputs, the amazing outputs with you. So for everyone that's logged in and are wondering what on earth part one is, I doubt there are many, but there are a few people that maybe haven't been indoctrinate, indoctrinated yet. I thought I'd start off by explaining a little bit more about Parkrun and its origins. So 
It all started one dreary day in October in 2004 in Bushy Park in London. And there was a guy, Paul, who was struggling mentally, having lost his job, suffering an injury, which meant he couldn't run. And he wanted a way to connect with his friends. And so invited a few of them down to Bushy Park to do a 5K. So Paul said go to 13 of his mates, press the start button on his stopwatch and time them all as they ran around the park. He wrote the results with a pen and paper and then everyone headed to a local cafe for a chat. And on that day, Paul gave a prize for the first finisher and a prize for the final finisher. And that's where the concept of Park Run was born. So what's Park Run today? So at head office level, we're a UK based charity and we support the delivery, like Rob said, of timed 5K events called Park Runs, which are held every Saturday morning in areas of open space and also oversee the delivery of 2K events or junior park runs, which are specifically for four to, four to 14 year olds and their families and they're held on a Sunday. And it's really important to emphasize that these events are delivered by the community for the community and are organized by local teams of amazing volunteers without whom Park Run really wouldn't exist. So every event is free, free to take part in. People can participate in whatever way they want. They can come along and walk, they can jog, they can run, they can volunteer, feed the ducks, or come along and join people for a coffee afterwards. So I guess in this respect, not much has changed since Paul founded it in, in 2004, but in terms of the numbers, so much has changed. So we now have over a thousand events in the UK with over 700 5K events and well over 300 junior park run events on Sunday. But unsurprisingly, the growth of events has also brought about a growth in participants. And at its height, before our events were closed last March due to COVID-19, we saw 200,000 people take part in events across the UK on a single weekend. And in total, 2.7 million people have participated across the UK since 2004, with 120,000 new participants last year alone. But it's not just in the UK that we have a growing footprint. We have events in 23 countries around the world, from the plains of South Africa to the freezing tundra in the Baltics, which doesn't look that appealing to me, actually, and everything else in between. So we now have over 2,200 events globally, and South Africa and Australia are the largest of those in terms of participant numbers. So yes, at its heart, Park Runs are five or 2K events, but in reality, they are so much more. They're a, how do I put it? They're a social opportunity, a chance to connect with others and with nature, a chance to build friendships, to move in the open air, to increase self-confidence and self-esteem and agency, to learn new skills. So essentially in Part Run, we have this amazing model for personal self-care and a means of tackling the root causes of ill, of, of Ill health and all of the inequalities. And we can do this at scale and importantly, a very very low cost and we've been really pleased that to hear part run described as the most significant public health initiative of the 21st century and given the impact that we have on health and well-being it's no surprise that we changed our mission in 2015-2016 from having a part run in every community that wanted one to creating a healthier and happier planet. And really we're only beginning to scratch the surface in terms of understanding our footprint and the changes we can make, the real life changes we can make to people and communities through Park Run. And generating that insight is really the work of one of my teammates, Mike Graney, who I'd like to hand over now to explain a little bit more about the wealth of data that we have, that we collect, and importantly, how we use that data. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, so Chrissy's mentioned some pretty impressive numbers there. 
but also it's the mission to create a healthier and happier planet is the thing that really, really drives us. And measuring our progress towards that is a major part of my job as head of analysis at the part run globally. And a big part of this task is tracking who participates and who doesn't participate at part run. And a key source of the information for working this out is gathered every time somebody registers with Park Run and prints out their barcode. So here's my old dog-eared uh, barcode there from 10 years ago, very nicely laminated, it's lasted pretty well. And so from this, we know people's age, their gender, we know their location from their postcode information, and very importantly, the activity level in the four weeks prior to when they registered to Park Run. So then every time someone participates as a walker, a runner or a volunteer, we capture and we report on this. But also we're really interested in who does not participate at Park Run. And we know that certain groups, including females, those least active at the point of registration and also younger registrants, so under 35 and particularly under 25 year olds, are less likely to make that jump from registering with Park Run to coming along and completing their first Park Run. The really positive thing is though that once people from all groups come along to their first part run and the first couple of part runs, the positive experience that they have means that the rate to which they return to part run for a second occasion and a third and a fourth occasion is much more equal across the different groups. So through our barriers research, which is research that we do every two years, and we survey those who have registered at part run and either not participated or just participated once. And we know that not feeling fit enough and a fear of being judged when they are participating are two of the major barriers to people's participation along with not having enough time and that's one of the reasons why we feel that walkers at park run are so important and we're so passionate to doing what we can to encourage walkers at park run because the more walkers we see at park run it kind of creates a virtuous circle where new participants particularly those who are less like the stereotypical runner see more people walking and more people with slower times participate in a park run and feel more comfortable that park run is for people like them and not just for the racing whippets at the front of the field. I'll show you the progress that we're making on walking shortly, but we've still got a, a long way to go here. And so we're doing all we can to increase walkers. We also work to build the understanding of the experience of park run volunteers. And in the last few years, we've certainly come to understand the benefits of volunteering much, much more. So an example would be the typical park run volunteer actually came to park run with very little previous volunteering experience. They then start, part, start uh, volunteering at park run, have a very positive experience in their first time that they um, volunteer at park run, with nine out of 10 people saying that the jobs that they do at park run for volunteering are easy, and nine out of 10 of them saying that the job was enjoyable to carry out as well. So from there, they they return to um, volunteer more and more, develop confidence, develop skills like communication and teamwork. And really importantly, after they volunteer, it leaves them feeling much happier and boost and provides a boost to their mental health. So they're just a couple of bits of insight that we do on a regular basis at Park Run. Now I'll show you a few numbers and a couple of charts because that's really what I like to do in my job a lot of the time. So here, what we've got here, is uh, UK numbers taken at the 12 months to the middle of March. Um, so the latest data on the right hand side takes us to the point when events were paused due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And so what we can see here is that in the 12 months to last March, well over half a million um, park runs were completed in that year um, by people who were active less than once per week in the months before they registered. So they're very much people who've come off, off the couch and are participating regularly at park run. So consistent growth here, but we'd certainly like to continue to see this accelerate. As I mentioned, from the postcode information, we can see that those living in the most deprived quarter of areas in the UK were heading towards 1 million walks, jogs and runs per year in the UK. So we'd like to see that 1 million barrier smash really quite soon on that. There's also been a clear increase in the numbers walking at 5k park runs. So you can see on the right hand side of the chart here that over 150,000 walks at UK 5k events per year. And we define a walk in this instance as a finish time of 50 minutes or more. It just keeps it very straightforward in terms of the reporting. But more than just an increase in walking, we've seen a really significant and sustained uh, increase in the overall finish times at Park Run. 
So in 2005, the average part run finish time was 22 minutes and 17 seconds. Fast forward to 2020, and it was exactly eight minutes slower than that. So at 30 minutes and 17 seconds in the UK, and globally, the average time was in excess of 33 minutes. So this is really quite a, a simple measure that shows that part runners increasingly welcome people for whom physical activity wasn't previously the norm in their lives. So clearly it's a uh, need to touch on, on COVID and the impact that COVID has had on part runner and clearly across the world. So as you'll be aware, currently part run events remain paused across many territories following their closure in the middle of March 2020. But we do have some territories that have reopened, particularly led by Australia, one of our major territories that is now fully reopened. And so last weekend, we had over 400 events and in excess of 60,000 participants last weekend. So we're, you know, we're building back up, but there's clearly been a major impact here. And during the COVID-19, so from March, and through 2020, we actually spoke to more park runners than we ever have done before. So we actually saw an increase in the, the amount of insight work that we did through last year. And that's really helped us understand the impact of the pandemic and the associated lockdown measures on park runners and on park run communities. So we ran research across our major territories. So UK, Ireland, South Africa, Australia. We also did some work in New Zealand. And two things became really clear through the research that we did last year. Firstly, we noted a real resilience in terms of part runners' desire to get back to part run when it is safe to do so. And secondly, in terms of their experiences, the key theme was that connections to others in our communities has been negatively impacted across everywhere throughout the pandemic. And feeling part of the community again is a really key motivator for those who are keen to get back part running again. Really, it all comes down to the quote that Chrissy shared earlier, which was, I attend not because it's a run, well, because it's a community and I certainly can't wait to get back to my local event at Worsley Woods and I know it's the same for basically millions of park runners across the world. So now I'll hand you back to Chrissy and Rob who are going to talk about how we actually go about striving to create a healthier and happier planet. That's great thanks ever so much uh, Mike. Um, the right man for the job when it comes to the data, that's uh, that, that's for sure. Um, uh, Chrissy, if, if I may, I, I'm um, I've always been taken uh, by job titles, and yours is a yours is a good one. Head of global health and well-being, so that's quite a responsibility. I mean, what does that what does that actually mean exactly? Yeah. It's a <laughs> It's a rather grand title and, and, and daunting if I, if I think about it. You know, if we take a step back, I think the whole organisation is, is dedicated to, to promoting health and wellbeing. So definitely not just me and, and, and not just my team that, you know, I'm so privileged to, to lead. Our day-to-day our -day business is devoted to making the world healthier and happier. And if we simply stuck to delivering events in accordance with, with our model, then we'd achieve great things. But in terms of my role and my team's role, it's to look beyond what we can achieve through this single model and see if we can layer on additional impact. So focus on those who may benefit from part run who might ordinarily be excluded, those with chronic health conditions or disabilities, people from areas of social deprivation, black and minority ethnic groups, women and girls, those in custody and so forth. So this means looking at every area of our business and seeing how we can have an even bigger impact on health and well-being. So promoting social inclusion and reducing health and well-being inequalities. So first and foremost, my role is to lead a really experienced and passionate and committed team of people of which Mike is, is one. Um, and this is this is staff, but also ambassadors, and to make to make this happen. So without them, I, I really couldn't do a thing. Um, but in, in terms of practice, first and foremost, it, it means looking closely at the registration and participation data, like Mike said, and augmenting this with further research, both that which we undertake internally and then externally with the help of of the research board. And as Mike said, we use this insight to build a picture, hold ourselves to account, and come up with solutions. Um, our team 
looked at the registration process and the event delivery model to see what changes we might make to make it more inclusive. So for example, in 2017, we re renamed Tail Runner, Tail Walker, and that was something that our team initiated, which was a seemingly minor change, but actually really, really significant in encouraging people, more people to walk at our events. We also um, kind of catalyzed the, deliver, um, the, sorry, the change to our registration form um, in terms of gender. So we, we undertook a, a, an extensive consultation and as a result of that added two more categories, which made it a lot more inclusive to those that didn't identify with the binary categories of male and female. Um, the health and wellbeing team also worked closely with the comms team to, to make sure that our comms reflect our mission and, and um, better enable us to engage the target audience. And then on top of this, we lead on the more ring-fenced projects, which are often taken in collaboration with other organisations across the physical activity sector and also beyond. And they're also supported by a team of, of health and wellbeing ambassadors, outreach ambassadors, custodial estate ambassadors. So they enable us really to penetrate those communities and provide that local level knowledge and, and insight and expertise that we may not have within the, the core health and wellbeing team. So in a nutshell, I, I lead a fantastic team. Our work is wide ranging. I feel really privileged, really honored to lead the team. And, and it's an incredible challenge and will continue to be so, especially you know, in the wake of, a wake of COVID. Yeah, yeah, sure. And you mentioned there a couple of the ways that you um, engage people from marginalized communities and i know that you've done uh work with people in uh, in custody uh, scenarios in prisons and also mm -hmm. looking at uh, working with the royal college of gps around social prescribing i wonder if you could tell us a bit more about those projects yeah great question rob it's tempting for physical activity organizations often to work in a silo and we realize that if we were to reach beyond our existing audiences, we needed to reach outside of the sector as well and collaborate across sectors. So whether, like you said, it's you know public health, justice, education. And so one example of that kind of cross-sectoral collaboration is the Part One Practice Initiative. We launched that in 2018 um, in collaboration with the Royal College of General pa Practitioners. And essentially, it's a social prescribing project which encourages GP practices to link with local part run events to become certified part run practices. So the practices themselves commit to signposting patients to part run, and importantly, also the staff take part themselves. But it wasn't it wasn't an initiative that, that my team came up with. Um, it wasn't imposed from the top down. It was actually the brainchild of clinicians who were already signposting patients to our events. And in fact, some practices were actually going a step further and setting up part run events themselves. So at the national level, RCGP and part run HQ simply provided this framework to, to scale it up. And I have to say, it's been run on a real shoestring with no external support, no external investment. But I think there's frugality has enabled us to be really creative to prioritize but I think most importantly to empower communities to take the lead um, both the event teams and, and the clinicians and it's been an incredible success so it, um, since it was launched in in June 2018 over 1,500 practices that's about 16% of UK practices have signed up wow. and it's now yeah. been rolled out in Ireland and is due to be launched in Australia this year. It's won a number of national awards. It's supported by Public Health England, by NHS England. And like I said before, really provides a great example of this kind of cross-sectoral collaboration, which can be a win-win for, for all involved at the national level, the regional level and very much at, at the local community level too. Yeah, and, and that um, that spirit of co-production is uh, mm. it's at the heart of what we're trying to do at AWRC. And we've seen in your approach to Parkrun how that is at the heart of sustainability and that uh, that, that, that ownership and, um, and sense of 
uh, control of the people that run it is so important to to engaging and developing communities. And and um, Mike showed his uh, rather dog-eared laminated uh, barcode earlier. I, I'm I'm interested with the there we go the the uh, proliferation of technology that we have currently. Whether you've ever been tempted to you know get the part run app and uh, and uh, you know sort of digitize the whole process get rid of the the queuing what are your thoughts on that yeah it's a really great question rob and, and, and gets to the heart of what part run is about and what we want to do at part run is change the narrative around activity and movement and what it means to, to be active and why people are active and why it's important. And the foundation for activity, sustained activity, and the foundation for health is community. It's rich, meaningful connections between, between people. And at every stage of our model of, of event delivery, we embed interaction. So at the start, as people are congregating, you know, during the event, we encourage groups to come together and, and interact. People are cheering at the side, volunteers are interacting with each other. And then importantly, to your point about technology, during the finish funnel, they're handed a token, which slows people down, enables them to interact and communicate and talk to each other. And then that token is then scanned um, by a volunteer by a number of volunteers which again promotes further interaction you know us british are, are wonderful at queuing so there's a lot of queuing that's involved and and we may laugh at that and some people may say look look it's a waste of time why would you encourage people to queue but if you go to a park run and you you see people queuing you'll realize that that's the bedrock of health that's the bedrock of interaction and community in the building of friendships and and after that queue everyone piles into you know their their, their local cafe and and interacts a little bit more so at its heart part run is is not a run it's not even a 5k walk it's it's a social opportunity and if we were to digitalize that uh, or you know introduce timing chips we don't believe it would change part run for the better. It would change part run for the worse because it would remove everything that was special and everything that was important about part run. Yeah, yeah, here, here. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chrissy. And um, the temptation is just because you can that you feel like you should. And of course, understanding mm. what works um, and understanding the active ingredients of what makes park run so special is is one of the. Uh, the key things that we're really trying to get underneath the skin of with the research board and so I'm going to um, segue into our next speaker who uh, if you want to understand the role of technology in sport has very literally uh, written the book on it. Um, my colleague and director of engagement here at the AWRC Professor um, Steve Hake. Steve uh, chairs the Park Run Research Board um, can often be found with his head buried in a Park Run data spreadsheet and uh, has some uh, fascinating insights into uh, understanding more about this global health and well-being uh, program that is Park Run. So uh, Steve, uh, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, over to you. Right. Th thanks very much, uh, Anna. You know, thanks to to Mike uh, and Chrissy. Um, every time they talk, I learn something new about Parkrun, and particularly Mike, I struggle to keep up with his stats. His stats. Every time I go to quote how many partners there are, it, the number has changed, and I have to ask Mike again. So, um, so I'd like to talk about the impact of Parkrun on health and happiness. Um, but I think what I'd like to do is I'd just like to make a comment about the, the uh, Parkrun Research Board. So this down here is an address for the Parkrun Research Board. It's not Parkrun because we're not Parkrun. We are independent from Parkrun, although we work very, very closely together. And the aim of the, the research board is to really firstly manage research proposals which come into Parkrun 
all the time. So that was the first thing. But also equally to be a bit more proactive and answer the questions that Parkrun are really interested in answering. So they have their internal insights, which is really fast moving, quick questions. And then we have the academic side. Uh, so we'll ask the same questions as Mike and then we'll publish them about three years later. So we're a little bit slower than, <laughs> than Mike and Chrissy. But if anyone wants to know a little bit more about the data and the papers and the re reports, if you look on this website here, it'll be on every page uh, of my slides, so you can pick that up uh, all the way through. Um, and I, I'd like to say that it did exist before we took it over. Um, you know, it was uh, uh, working prior to us uh, with the likes of Andy Shannon, uh, who set it up back in, I, I'm not entirely sure when, uh, the early 2010s. So, Let's move straight on. So this is the, uh, the park run uh, mantra. We've uh, said that. And, and here is our local uh, park run here. This is my local park run at Encliffe Park. And I do believe that if you, if you stand at the start line of a park run, um, at about nine o'clock, within a few minutes, you can kind of see the whole world go past. You see your whole community uh, run past you and you can see kind of a selection of them there from the skinny whippets as Mike calls it at the front uh, looking at their watches through to what I call normal people and of course one of the uh, the questions some of the questions we want to ask are what motivates people to first go to parkrun and then what is the impact of parkrun on their health and happiness so two key questions uh, we'd really uh, like to to ask so um, back in 2018, uh, we sent out a survey uh, working with Parkrun to ask our uh, Parkrunners exactly those questions. And here's our survey. Uh, I worked very closely with Alice Bullis and, and Helen Quirk. Uh, and in fact, they did a fantastic job in corralling me and corralling uh, the Parkrunners to, to do this. So that was the survey we sent out in 2018. And uh, we got back 60,669 usable uh, surveys. Uh, we had 11 million uh, answers to 47 questions. And you know, when you get those surveys, you put in, you know, anything else you'd like to tell us. Well, we, we put that in. Now, park runners are really keen. And in terms of answers to those and anything else you'd like to tell us questions, we had so many answers. We had 14,000 answers that actually we literally got war and peace on Parkrun. 600,000 words, which will take me the rest of my life uh, to, to analyse. Um, but I'd like to just give you a little bit of the things that we found out um, uh, from that survey. So why do people first go to Parkrun? What did people say? Well, here was a question we asked. Um, what motivated you to first participate at Parkrun as a runner or walker? So key things there, runners or walkers. And although I won't share it here, we asked the same question of volunteers. So you have runners, walkers and volunteers, and those are the three kind of groups that we have. And in terms of our motives, we ask people to select uh, three, three of 20. Uh, and of course, if those, none of those 20 fit, we could, they could write other. And of course, park runners, they did write other. 2,000 people wrote as others, and I'll share a few of you, a few of those in a minute. So what did they say? Well, okay, so here we go. Um, so actually, I'm going to have to just pause for a minute because I have my window such a way that I can't see my screen. OK, here we go. So fitness became was, was the top one. It's kind of pretty clear. Uh, fitness, physical health, sense of personal achievement to get a recorded time for a 5K, weight management. My friends, family or colleagues wanted me to to spray and train for another event and mental health. Interestingly, mental health was quite low on motives. So these are the reasons why people first went to Parkrun, with fitness and physical health being those top ones and sense of personal achievement coming next. Now let's look at, let's split Parkrunners up. Let's look at uh, males and we'll look at females. I'll say males and females because our answers were 16 plus. So we kind of got girls and women, boys and boys and men. So when it comes to fitness, men are more interested in the average in fitness and women slightly less, but still, you know, over half 
put down fitness as the key thing here. In terms of physical health, men slightly more interested than women in physical health. In terms of sense of achievement, women more interested in that sense of personal achievement of having done uh, this parkrun. And then these are all the other questions are pretty similar between uh, males uh, and females. If we look at the, the uh, deprived, so Mike mentioned that we have the lowest quarter uh, of, of deprivation within uh, our respondents here. Um, again, less interested in fitness, but more interested in physical health and pretty similar answers uh, going further down. What about inactives? Those who've done less than our 30 minutes of activity within a week, what we would call inactive people. Again, less interested in fitness, but much more interested in, in physical health. Interested in that sense of personal achievement. Interestingly, interested in getting a recorded time for a 5K. That goes with this sense of personal achievement. Can I do 5K? I'm inactive. Can I actually make it? And we get a lot of people doing couch to 5K in preparation uh, for, uh, for that. Weight management is more important. And interestingly, not interested in another event and really less interested in mental health. So that was kind of interesting. So here we've got that crossover, people from deprived communities who are also inactive. These are people that really struggle to do physical activity because of all these things that are, that are against them. And less interested in fitness, more interested in physical health, that sense of personal achievements that's probably the highest of any of the groups, getting that recorded 5K time, can I do it? Uh, weight management more interested in, and again, less interested in mental health. So that's why people are saying with our preceptive answers, why they go to Parkrun. So what do they say? Well, okay, here's some of the things they say. Uh, the first time I ever did my mum, uh, did it, my mum dragged me there and I burst into tears midway through in front of my super healthy dad. Uh, this is a young girl who then went on to do Parkruns and 10Ks and, and marathons. Uh, here we've got another reason. My daughter harasses me. So it's not just uh, mums harassing daughters, it's daughters harassing mothers as well. Um, a friend bet me I couldn't run 5k before I turned 40. Uh, my husband promised me fabulous new trainers. Yes, really, lol. Uh, I was encouraged by Paul Sinton Hewitt to take part. Well, well, aren't we all? So he founded it. And then my postman told me about it. Thank you, posties uh, around the country, uh, telling everyone to go and do parkrun. So those are some of the, 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 the comments that people come up with. So now, We've got our partners who've done parkrun. What's the impact of parkrun on their health and happiness, given that that's the mantra of, of, of parkrun? So again, here's question 36 of our 47, the impact of running or walking at parkrun. And this is the question, thinking about the impact of parkrun on your health and well-being, to what extent has running or walking at parkrun changed? And we've got a list of answers. And we go from much worse, worse, no impact, better to much better. So we give people the opportunity to say whether physical activity has got worse or whether it's got better. And we've got 17 other questions that people answered and they answer, we asked them to answer all of them. Now, people answered mostly no impact, better or much better. People who answered, there was only about less than half a percent of people who answered much worse and worse. Now, of course, there's biases in the, in the, in the survey, and there's all sorts of caveats with that. But in terms of our respondents, it was either no impact, better or much better. And what I'm going to talk about now is the proportions saying better and much better, because that's what I'm interested in. The first instance we will come on to the worst, much worse in a later, uh, later analysis. So here we go. This is what they say. So this is just running or walkers at the moment. So sense of personal achievement, 90%, nine out of 10 said their sense of personal achievement was improved. Similarly, their fitness was improved. Their physical health was improved by over 80%, 80 to 90%. Happiness, just short of eight out of 10 people said their happiness was improved by running or walking at Parkrun. So there you go, there's your mantra, health and happiness, both improved by about eight, for eight out of 10 of those people. And the remainder two out of 10, most of them said, no impact. I'm happy enough, I'm healthy enough. We also have amount of time spent outdoors, 
pretty much improved. Your enjoyment of competing, how much you feel part of a community. 70% of people said that their feeling of part of community was improved. And hey, look at this, 70% said that their mental health improved. Remember, very few people put that down as an actual motive for turning up to Parkrun, and yet 70% said that mental health was improved. Confidence was 60%, and your ability to be active in a safe environment, a very important thing, as we'll just see in a minute. And what I'll do is I'll compare now uh, males and females. So males and females, let's look at the differences there. Women, the sense of personal achievement slightly higher than men. And again, that matches to the mo back to their motives. And that's the highest thing that people put down, that women put down. Fitness, physical health, equally. Although women were less interested in fitness and physical health than men, um, actually, the impact was pretty similar. Happiness, slightly higher, females versus males. Amount of time spent out outdoors, slightly higher than males. And again, that matches to this one here your ability to be active in a safe environment, having somewhere where you can go out and feel safe and do your running. A lot of the time, what women say, what females say, the, the impact is higher than that of males. How much you feel part of the community, the mental health impact, confidence, and so on. So we look at our other, quickly run through our other subgroups. So here's our inactives. Okay, uh, key things to, to pull out there is sense of personal achievement, fitness and health slightly higher than the average amount of time spent outdoors, ability to be active in a safe environment higher. If we look at our deprived communities and then our inactive and deprived communities, again, those who really struggle to do physical activity for many, many reasons of inequality. You've got sense of personal achievement as high as any others, but some of the things that jump out, this ability to, tend to spend time outdoors, that ability to be active in a safe environment. You know, some environments, it's just not particularly nice to go out running and Parkrun enables people to do that and improves their confidence. So there were just a few questions uh, left over that I couldn't fit on that graph. So I've just had them on in here. And I think the key one I'd like to pull out here is this overall lifestyle choices that certainly for those from uh, the deprived communities who are inactive, seeing that quite a large change, a large positive impact to their overall lifestyle choices. So Parkrun is really do something great for our communities. I'd just like to just quickly mention volunteering. And okay, this red one here is our runners and walkers. You've seen that before. And the blue one is just the volunteers. And I'll just point out some differences. So for those who volunteer, only 20 to 30% get an improvement in their physical health and the rest say literally no, no impact on their physical health or fitness. But considering volunteer is not aimed at physical fitness, I think that's quite a success. On the other hand, what you see over here is feeling part of a community, volunteers get a greater impact on that than runners or walkers and the number of new people they meet, they get a greater impact of runners or walkers. And the rest that are left, you get about 85% of the benefits of running or walking. So volunteering really does impact on those people who take part. So I'll just leave you with a few comments. Do you know, I'm, I'm not gonna read these because I break up a little bit every time I read these. So I'll let you read these yourself silently. Um, and here we go. So hopefully you've had a chance to, to read through those. And, and those are literally three comments I just randomly uh, selected. And uh, it tells you how important Parkrun is to people as Mike and as Christy have, have just said. And I'd just like to finish off uh, with our finishing line on the Olympic Legacy Park. This is our uh, junior park run and there you've got some of the school uh, uh, next door to us just finishing off on that we've got our own junior park run on the legacy park in one of the most deprived parts of uh, of sheffield and i think if, if it was a take-home message i wanted you to to have 
it was that, that Parkland really does do what it says on the tin, improving health and happiness of our population. And it, and it really is like, like a social event that just happens to have a run attached to it. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, really insightful uh, presentation about the impact of, uh, of Park Run and the uh, stories that we hear consistently about the, you know, the individuals and what Park Run means to them, um, as you say, is uh, incredibly important to get out there. And I, I've always been struck by uh, this, a story that was in relation to one of the uh, park runs in the prison where I think a mother um, who was outside and her son was in the prison um, felt like there was a sense of connection because of, uh, they were taking part in the same activity at the same time on a Saturday morning. And even though they weren't physically uh, next to one another doing it, there was a real strong sense of, uh, of connection. And so it really does bring people together across uh, different communities and sectors. Um, I've been uh, tracking the chat uh, for, uh, we've got a bit of time for uh, Q&A. So um, uh, I'd encourage um, people on the, uh, on the webinar to use the chat function if you have uh, any additional questions, but I've pulled a few out. And there's a, a general theme, uh, Steve, perhaps if I could start with you with this, about the engagement in Parkrun uh, amongst disadvantaged communities and whether that has changed over time and what we know about that uh, about that journey um yeah i mean i think uh, just looking at the stats and mike will have the stats uh, much better than i do but i was just uh, looking back at something i had where my data finishes in 2018 and certainly from uh, deprived communities the, the the bottom quarter it had gone up from just under 10 uh, 10 percent to over 13 and a half percent in 2018 so that proportion was increasing uh, and then in terms of the uh, inactive communities that had gone from quite a low level of five percent back in 2011 to you know it's now at least 10 percent so that inactive is the, is the bit that's growing most and last time i looked it was growing by about uh, 0.75 you know three quarters of a percent per year and the the opposite to that is we found that those who are the most active was decreasing as a proportion so the most active is going down and the least active is going up uh, they'll never quite cross over uh, but but that's a really good you know thing to see and mike might be able to <laughs> update those numbers a little bit better yeah i think it's i think it's spot on steve yeah we're certainly seeing a steady and, and consistent improvement in that data i think one thing that um is kind of worth talking about when we're talking about deprivation is we've had quite a lot of focus around deprivation for junior 2k events and we've we annually we've surveyed the participants and the parents of people at of, of participants at junior 2k events and one thing we see from a deprivation point of view so we one of the questions or sets of questions we asked is in terms of what's been the impact on the child and generally we've seen a clear majority saying the child is now more active they've got a better active attitude towards physical activity and then there's all things around that there's a little bit of uh, confidence improvements there and then also the family spends more time together more time in the park and even the parents even though they're not necessarily the ones running and walking at junior park run even the parents are seeing a significant increase in terms of their uh, their fitness and their activity levels and from a deprivation point of view the really positive thing there is for each year that we've run this survey across each measure each sort of positive impact that we've seen people from the more deprived areas are more likely to be feeling every single one of the benefits that I've mentioned there. So yeah, I think part one in, in deprived communities is absolutely a, a huge positive impact. And, and actually, Mike, I just want to check this. One of the things that I, I've, I've sensed in the data is that people who are previously inactive or from deprived communities uh, get very passionate about parkrun. And they, it looks like they once they've signed up to parkrun, they do more park runs, more volunteering sessions and so on. They very, get very, very emotionally attached to it. Do you see that? Yeah, I think that's true. I think it's the case. I mean, as I mentioned with the barriers work before, there are challenges in going from that registration point to, to the first park run. But then, yeah, once people are there, I think people become become park runners, become evangelical about everything like, like everybody you've heard from on this call today. 
Great, thanks uh, for that. And there's there's a um, a couple of related questions in the chat. One specifically from uh, Gareth Snelson, who um, identifies uh, within uh, Milton Keynes in his uh, population that uh, are there any plans to engage with Black, Asian, and ethnic minorities specifically, and are there examples perhaps of uh, strategies of, of where that's worked well um, across the parkrun? Um, I, I don't mind who who perhaps has a go at that. Um, Chrissy, I'm, do you want to? Well, certainly from the data, I mean, it it, it, it is true. Um, so you know, uh, the BAME community is not well re represented. Uh, in Parkrun, you know, it's less than 10%. It's kind of, you know, it, 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 I don't know in Parkrun participants, but in our survey, it was not well represented. Um, as, as for the things we can do about that, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to bounce that one over to Mike and Chrissy because that is a tough one. Yeah, it's, it's a, a, a great question and one that's obviously, you know, incredibly topical and, and, and incredibly important i think it's really important for us to recognize that change takes time you know it's got us to it's taken 16 years for us to get to the point where we can support 2200 events across the world and shifting the needle in terms of the demographics that take take part also will take time and and the key to that is addressing the many barriers to participation that, that, that people face. And, and just going back to the first question about deprivation and how we've, we've achieved that, it's by breaking down some of those barriers to participation, access being one in particular. So in, in, in answer to, to the second question about engaging BME, BAME communities, I think we need um, a lot more insight. Um, we need a lot more data around that. Um, we need to better understand the barriers to participation that, that those communities and accepting that it's not a homogenous group, those communities face in, in engaging with, with part run. And, and access is one of those. And in launching events in areas of deprivation, and I think we all know that the links between ethnicity and, and deprivation status in, in, in improving proximity and, and, and convenience for, um, for those people, hopefully that will in turn over time result in an increase in participation. And there is a, a snowball effect as as a few members of certain groups take part so as others see that see them as ro role models and and also take part but for us access isn't sufficient because people might have an event close to them and still face those barriers and we lean heavily on our our team of outreach ambassadors to like i said before really penetrate those communities and enable us to have that, that local level insight and expertise, which will enable us at the community level to address some of those barriers and act as mouthpieces for park run and encouraging members of their community, whatever their ethnicity, to come along and, and, and try park run. But we're also accepting that park run is not the panacea. You know, it, 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 it's not appropriate for everyone. It's not convenient for everyone. But what we want to, to do is make sure that the opportunity is there for as many people as possible. That's, that's our role. And encourage as many people as possible to, to, to come to their parks and, and to move in the company you know, in the company of others. And, 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 and that's our priority, but working at the very, very local level, developing our outreach and developing our insight will be, will be key to, um, to engaging those communities and breaking down some of the barriers um, that they face. Okay, um, we've probably got time for a couple more questions. Um, there's a question here, um, there's a couple actually in the chat related to uh, any analysis on virtual park runs. Uh, uh, Mike, um, uh, Steve, any uh, any insight on the impact of virtual park runs during the, the current um, conditions? Yeah. So in terms of in terms of uh, virtual park runs or, or not park run, and um, clearly one of the, the biggest insights has been a major success. So in terms of number, I've just got the dashboard up in front of me. Uh, Ian Rutson's incredible dashboard here. So yeah, over nine hundred thousand. 
um, not part runs uh, have been have been logged and currently we're seeing around 30,000 uh, per week. I think in terms of insight, in terms of who is actually uh, participating, the biggest, the, the one of the most exciting ones for me is in terms of how many people have come through to uh, to do a not part run, to complete a not part run, who haven't actually um, completed a, a a normal part run who haven't included part run and that number now sits if i'm reading it right and ian will give me a click around there if this is wrong but it looks like it's 8420 so since we started in june eight thousand, more than eight thousand individuals who haven't previously completed a part run have now gone on to do a not park run which i think is just absolutely yeah absolutely tremendous success we will uh, carry on um, analyzing and, and do more work around around who they are. I think what will be very interesting to us is to what extent will not part run and, and virtual part runs, what role will that play when part run returns? So in Australia, clearly in, in particular, you know, it'd be very, very interesting to see what role that plays, whether that could play a role in attracting people from outside of part run you know, into part run. Maybe people who can't make it on a Saturday morning, maybe people who are busy from that point of view, people who, you know, I've mentioned you know, lacking in confidence and the fear of judgment, that kind of thing. It may be an excellent gateway into part run. But yeah, at the moment, huge success and kind of incredibly, the number of people that have not done a part run, but are uh, participating in not part run is really, really heartening to see. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mike. And then perhaps to, to close, uh, Chrissy, um, what uh, what do you see as kind of uh, next for Parkrun? What's on your kind of probably lengthy to do list um, in twenty twenty one? Yeah, our, our priority as as a team as um, at the moment is is to facilitate the resumption of all Parkrun events across the world. Um, we have a number of countries. Um, that have restarted, um, Australia, Japan, you know, New Zealand to name, but, but a few. So that's um, an incredibly, you know, positive step forward. Um, but, you know, we look forward to a time where participants in, in every parkrun territory can, can take part. And we know that in the wake of COVID, and hopefully there will be a wake of, of, of COVID, our, our work is, is more important than ever. Um, so as Mike, as Mike mentioned, we've undertaken a lot of insight work to understand the impact of, of, of COVID-19 and, and the associated restrictions on, on, on our community and the closure of park run events. Um, on, on the health and well-being of our community and we know that that feeling of disconnect and you know the the struggles that people are having with mental health is is is, is deep and profound and we are we have our work cut out for us as, as, as you implied in, in terms of addressing some of these even deep more deeply entrenched problems uh, that are going to face us in the UK but 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 globally as as well so I think coming out of uh, of COVID we we need to build a picture of of what people's health and well-being is has looked like and you know kickstart our efforts with energy and enthusiasm and and passion to to engage those that would benefit most from from Park Run, so that's really the priority going forward. Um, it's it's going to be an incredible challenge, but you know, like I said before, so fortunate to have the staff volunteer team to to support that that effort. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, I think uh, how fantastic that we have Park Run in our communities to be able to respond to uh, to that challenge. Um, the world is certainly a happier and healthier place as a result of it, and we look forward to seeing that growth. Um, can I thank our uh, speakers today, uh, Chrissy, Mike, Steve, for your fantastic contributions. I'd also like to thank uh, Jen, uh, Parry, uh, Carol Harris for all their incredible hard work behind the scenes to make this happen and run so smoothly. And finally, to uh, all the people on the webinar, thanks ever so much for joining us as part of our uh, public seminar series at the AWRC. You're very welcome to all the future ones. Uh, they'll be on the YouTube channel 
in due course. Um, enjoy uh, the rest of your day and uh, thanks again for your support.